Now, I've heard Father Vaney, many of you will know about him. He's a, he's a noted academic. He did an MA at Canterbury. Um, he studied his theology at the Gregorian University in Rome, and he did a PhD in Otago. And uh, he's a man of very wide interests, uh, spiritual and theological and ethical, uh, and uh, he's, an, as I say, a noted academic. I have heard Father Vaney most recently speaking as an ethicist in response to uh, an invitation to appear on the national program. I have heard him speaking there uh, clearly, articulately, uh, and making the points that are so essential to a proper understanding of the ethics associated with human life. An extraordinarily gifted man. But now he's going to talk to us today about launching a Catholic discipleship college in New Zealand. And Father's been working tirelessly for several years, and he was talking about the Catholic Discipleship College based on the uh, Paul II Bible School in Alberta in Canada. And um, Father Neil is convinced that we must launch a similar college in New Zealand to reach our young people who are becoming more and more isolated from virtually all community commitments. And you know, that is absolutely right. And I'm not sure that we as parents should be blaming ourselves too much because I think the influence in their lives seems mainly to come from outside the home. I've been through the process of thinking, now where did I go wrong? I'm sure my father thought that. <laughs> His father, um, I don't know, I never saw him. Um, but my father was a Victorian, so, you know, born at that particular time. I just look old. I'm only in my um, upper thirties. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies, incidentally, do not go into their sixties. They are in their upper fifties. <laughs> that's right. That's what that's, so, ladies, never go beyond that. I heard a young man asking me, how old is that lady? And I said, you never, ever ask a lady how old she is. <laughs> if she feels that you need to know, she will inform you. That's the idea. Now, Dr. Vaney also serves as the liaison priest for the bishop with the Catholic Charismatic Renewal, and his latest book is called Christ in a Grain of Sand. He is a formidable priest. He's from the Society of Mary. He's the Reverend Dr. Neil Vaney. Hello. Thank you for that beautiful introduction. Thank you so much. When Annetta was speaking, I was profoundly moved because she brought back to me something of my inheritance. When I was at Canterbury University doing my master's degree, I didn't know a lot about my grandparents, except I knew one lot was Irish and my grandmother had died when I was small. And when I was doing my research, I discovered that my great-grandfather was an Irish gold miner over in Charleston on the west coast. I guess some of you have probably been there. If you go there now, I think there's one pub and a cemetery. In its heyday, there were 5,000 uh, miners there and 50 pubs. <laughs> Real Irish place. And um, I went down the road, and we found the cemetery, and I walked in there, and I walked around, and I saw this big monument that said, Sacred to the Memory of Daniel Dennehy. And it gave all his ancestors and things like that. And then I had that same sort of experience that Annetta recalled. It was as if this man that I had never known was standing there beside me. He said, Neil, I have been waiting so many years for you to return. And I am so proud because I prayed and worked all my life that this would happen to some descendant of mine. I'm also remarkably almost exactly the same age as Annetta is. And my vision is actually something which I hope is going to come to pass. And I'm going to describe that now for you. And I've got up there, Jesus among the youth, a strategy for a new beginning. And what I have is we have four parts to this presentation. I want to speak about what is the religious situation for young people today 
and what's the difficulties we're facing? Why do many, so many of our young Catholics seem to walk away from the church and so few of them come back? We really have to ask that question and say, are we giving them the love that the Lord came to give us? The second thing I think, and Philip mentioned this, is we can't flagellate and blame ourselves. There's something much wider happening in the world that we have to understand. And when you actually understand this, it actually takes a load a bit off your shoulders because you think, aha, that's what it is, and now we can do something about it. When you feel helpless, you know, you, don't, you lose all your energy and you don't know what you can do, and I think this is part of it. I then want to talk about this amazing place I visited in Canada where you land uh, in the capital there, Edmonton, and you just go for hours and hours across this featureless plain, and you land in this tiny little place with about 200 people in it and this amazing Bible school. And then I want to talk about how we could create something similar to New Zealand. And I want to really challenge you because, in fact, the movement in Canada came out of a group of lay people who had this vision and they worked and slaved and put it together. And that's the only way it will happen in New Zealand. I can't do it. Our hierarchy can't do it. They have so many demands on them. It will basically happen if grassroots, ordinary Christians and Catholics like yourself see the vision and are caught by it and want it and do it. And then it will happen. Nothing will stop God if God wants this to happen. Okay? Right. <laughs> okay. When I was first ordained, I had about uh, 14 years teaching in schools and at university. And one of the things I had to do was that I was then uh, asked to be a DRS. That's a Director of Religious Studies. Now, when I was a school teacher, I'd, I was very introvert, very, very shy as, as a young kid. You'd never believe it, looking at me talking now. But I was. I was so shy the first time I ever went to a dance. I went to ask the girl for a dance. I couldn't speak. I was so nervous. <laughs> ah, God does wonderful things, doesn't he? Okay. <laughs> So anyway, as a school teacher, I thought I was a total and complete failure. I went to teach the kids. The kids taught me the hard way, and I, I really found it so much of a struggle that I made a long retreat, a 30-day retreat, to see if I should ask my superiors to take me away from teaching because I was such a flop, such a failure. And um, as an amazing thing... What I'm going to talk about at the end, my book, partly came out of that experience. So God wastes nothing. That's one of the things that God's taught me in life. You may struggle for years and feel nothing has come from this and God is blessing you. So here in Auckland, I have been pondering for a long time about this and I asked the DRSs in Auckland, what were some of the significant issues you faced with Catholic young people? And these are three critical questions that I asked them. I said, among the families that you've got, um, how many do you think have some real form of religious belief or practice at home? It's something that really part of their life. The second thing I asked was, how many would have some sort of personal commitment or belief in God? They would reflect or pray or somehow reach out to the Lord. And I said, what's stopping that? What are the greatest obstacles? Now, in reply to the first question, this is the answers they gave me. I found, first of all, which a lot of you know, I guess, Auckland is not just one animal. If you go to the North Shore, you meet one sort of animal there. If you go down to Mangrae, it's a very different breed, okay? It's a very diverse place. The first thing they said was that um, there are three very different groups in Auckland. If we go to what we call the high decile schools, you know, schools which are fairly wealthy and good social areas, mainly Pākehā, it's only about 30% of families have some religious practice or belief at home. That was what they sort of estimated. In more mixed ethnic, where there's people from various ethnic groups, it's about 50. If you go to schools in uh, South Auckland, like Chris talked about, Mangare, about 80% of the families would have that. What about question two, about how many students actually believe? Now, most of the DRSs said this is a very hard question to answer. 
The main reason, first of all, if you teach boys, I know this, and you know this if you've got boys, you know, you say, what are you going to do today? They say, huh? Um, what, why didn't you do this? Ah, oh, you know. <laughs> boys don't articulate. And even, I was a boy once, you know. <laughs> even when we have powerful, deep feelings in us, it's very hard to get them out, especially when it's something very sensitive like religion, all right? The other thing about adolescence is that they're notoriously changeable. You ever notice that? One night you have this young girl in your house and she's so sweet and gentle and loving and she wants something from you, of course. And the next morning, you know, you want to take her to school and she says, don't want to go. <laughs> okay? It's that lesson, something they? they're just so changeable. But what all the DRHS has said, and I think this is so important, I believe this from my heart, they said, many of our young people still have a thirst and an openness for God and they want God in their lives very much, but finding him is the problem. And sometimes because of the world we live in, it's not necessarily the orthodox Catholic God that they know. Now, the fourth thing we came across was that if we looked at some of the South and West Auckland schools, what we discovered was this, that young people these days, because there's so much fragmentation, so much uncertainty, many of them like something really strong, black and white, and some were even attra attracted to fundamentalist positions. So I discovered that in parts of South and West Auckland, there are a number, not huge numbers, but a significant number of our youth who go to places, namely Protestant, Evangelical, New Life places, where they get Bible teaching, where they find strong music ministry, they share food, and they have strong youth fellowship. Now, some of them still remain Catholics. Some of them eventually wander off into this. Well, what's the block to our young Catholic people? And this is the response to question three. The first one is, as we all know, this whole world of conflicting sexual standards. Even if young people are not into sexual practice themselves, they just feel such confusion and such challenge here. Some of them who believed also feel incredibly marginalized. They, they cannot find anybody in their group who believes, and that is so hard for a young person. They feel this terrific social and media pressure upon them. Some of them, especially here in Auckland, there's a real car and party culture in some places. Money, having nice clothes, the right label is so important. And alcohol and other drugs are so available for young people now if they want them. If they want them, they'll get them. It's as simple as that. Peer pressure, their mates. Again, another sh frightening thing, that sometimes their families want their academic success, career, but they're not really interested in their faith. Not really. And some I've talked to and heard about who really believe cannot find someone to be their partner, their wife, their husband, and so they just despair. There's great teaching, Catholic social teaching and spiritual teaching is under great, great stress. They've told me that 20 or 30 years ago, if you had asked a, a group of seven former Catholics, how many might think that euthanasia might be acceptable in some circumstances? You might find two or three in the class. Today, if you ask that same question, half of them will put their hands up. That's just a social change that has occurred in 20 years. Same with the experiences of suffering, death, family, family breakups, so common. What can we bring our young people? Does our teaching on divorce and remarriage help them? Is it a pressure? Some of them just find it so hard to live out of the life of the gospel. Then the next thing that Annetta explained, that... Many of them feel it, but they can't explain it. They go to Polytech or University or Unitech, and people ridicule them. They can't explain or justify their faith, and so they just freeze. Others, and I guess this is for us, they see the church as the place where the elderly and irrelevant are. <laughs> oh boy, that, that, <laughs> that can hurt. And some, some places, there's great poverty of resources. Some of our poorer schools really struggle. Now, 
I'd been thinking about these things for a long time, and then as part of my academic work, teaching and lecturing in model of theology, I came across this amazing book I want to bring to your attention. It's an American book, and therefore you can't believe everything it says, but um, <laughs> there are still amazing things in it which I think speak to us. It's called Bowling Alone by Richard Putnam, and it came out in the year 2000. And this is the main thing he discovered when he looked at American life across all ages. He said that if you look at American life, what you discover is that they have three great major archives and they give a huge picture of American life from 1959 onwards. So it spans 50 years now almost. And in the last 25 to 30 years, there's been a huge social change going on. And this is the key thing, the key slide, I think, that would sum up so much of what's happened. His research, looking at all these archives, showed that there's an amazing decline in participation civilly and active involvement in organizations and clubs. America used to be the great place where you went out and bowled with your partners and leagues. They went out and poker clubs, you know, and going for games and playing things whist at your at mates' places. This was the whole life of America. Now it's being strangled, and you can trace how it's been strangled. I want you to have a look now at an interesting uh, diagram, which is trends in church attendance. We could just get that one up. Now, the amazing thing about this, and when it was pointed out to me, I thought it was extraordinary. If you look at the top of that graph there, this is across all churches in America, Catholic, Protestant, Evangelical. The greatest time of participation is about 1958. It starts to go down after that. Now, lots of Catholics have got very preoccupied about Vatican II, and they've said, you know, the church got better after Vatican II or got worse after Vatican II or things like that. But what it actually shows you, the decline in religious life was happening well before Vatican II. It started in the late 50s, 50s and it's sort of gone down ever since. And it's reached its low point in about the 1995. In the US, just at the very end of that graph, it's just slowly started to come up again. Is this God beginning to speak to the people? Are we on the brink of a possible change? I don't know, but this is the moment of grace perhaps. Now, the thing he found out, the next slide, what it says to you, and we might feel very strongly about this in New Zealand too, is that out there, there's now a huge number of people who have absolutely no connection with church whatsoever. They wouldn't know how Good Friday was different from um, Holy Saturday or Easter Sunday. They have no sense of religion at all. But the number of people who are very committed to religion has remained about the same. So what's happening, and we see this in our own nation, is our nation is becoming divided between people who are religious and people who are entirely, utterly unchurched. Now, I've got a little quote next from Putnam, and this is what it says. And you might reflect about this in your own life, and your own friendships. Our evidence also suggests that across a very wide range of activities, the last several decades have witnessed a striking diminution of regular contacts with our friends and neighbors. We spend less time in conversation over meals. We exchange visits less often. We spend more time watching and less time doing. We know our neighbors less well, and we see old friends less often. Does that sort of ring a bell for you, for some of you? You know, it's true, isn't it? A lot of those things are dying. I know a few priests who still try and go around and visit, you know, parishioners at night, and they say the worst thing is if you come in during news or what used to be homes, and they're trying to talk to you, and they're watching the television at the same time, and there's three conversations going on, and sometimes they'll be eating their meal at the same time, and they say, it's hopeless, it's hopeless, okay. Now, the interesting thing, though, is that there are four interesting counter-trends which we can see coming up on the slide here we find there is a youth, a rise in youth volunteering. So youth are still generous. If you give them a call, they will respond in amazing ways. There's extraordinary growth in telecommunications. We all know this, especially the power of the internet. One of the things, for example, they found in the USA now is I think of people under 30, uh, I think it's something like 70% never read a newspaper. They either watch the television or get it off the internet. 
They never read a newspaper. And this is happening to our young people. Another big change is that ordinary evangelical conservatives who once had nothing to do with politics and religion are now getting involved. And there's great increase in self-help groups. Now, I want to have a look at possible explanations for this. And I know that this is based on US research, but I think also it could be the same for us. Okay? Now, I'm not going to talk too much about these because I want to move on. But as I talk, list them, I think you'll see there's a lot of parallels. They said, what's the main reason for this? Is it just busyness and time pressure? Are we so frantically busy, we just haven't got time for our friends or other things? In the 1980s particularly to the beginning of the 90s, when everything was restructured and people lost their jobs, economic hard times, many women moved into the labor force, you had two career families, you know, um, dad going out in the morning working and then changing over and mum going out to clean offices at night, you know, I've met lots of families that have to do this. Residential mobility, you know, you live out at uh, South Auckland and you've got a job on the North Shore and you spend an hour in the car going to work and an hour in the evening going back, I mean that's two hours out of 24. Suburbanisation and sprawl, changes in employment. Following on, disruption of marriage and family ties, growth of the welfare state, civil rights revolution, 90s and 60s, including things like Vietnam, Watergate, disillusion with public life, okay? cultural revolt against authority. Now, out of that come two big conclusions, and these are the two crucial ones that Putnam talks about. He said, yes, extra traveling and longer work has had some impact. He said that growth in watching recreational TV is a major force. And he has four significant effects of increased TV watching. And if you've watched your kids, you know, and if you've seen friends who've got addicted to the box, this will probably ring a few bells. I think it's something like um, for every extra hour of TV that you watch, you are 10% less involved in the community. There are growing feelings of lethargy, passivity, and independence. There have been studies to show, for example, that if you sit in front of a television scene, screen, especially young children, if they monitor them, their energy levels and their metabolism rates actually drop. That's one of the reasons they get so huge fat. Because if you sit there grazing, and you know what kids do, they sit there and graze with all this food, you actually digest slower because your metabolism drops, and that's another reason why they get so gross. Okay. And it leads to materialist and consumerist values. Now, that, that leads to the next one, an impact of rise in electronic media of communication. And because I want to move on, I won't read it out, but it basically says that what television has done is contributed to make us more and more individual rather than thinking and feeling and perceiving as a group. And the next slide we'll move on to now talks about Generation X. That's young people born after 1980. And if you look at this, again, if you think of the young people you know, I'm sure you'll recognize so much here. The first thing that Putnam said was that young people stress personal and private over public and collective. In other words, they're into their world and they're not too interested in other worlds. They're visually orientated. They want to look and see things. That's why they're bored with church. Because who's going to listen to some boring old priest going on for 15 minutes? God, how boring. Because they're visual. They want to see it on a screen and they want it fast. They want it in 10 seconds, 15 seconds, 20 seconds. Okay? They're perpetual surfers. That's why they sit there in front of the box and go, dun, 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 and dun, 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 back the other way. Because that's how they work. They don't stop. They move on. Okay? They're interactive. They like doing it and being involved. They're multitaskers. Okay? Um, you know, like the kid, I, I could never understand. You go and visit kids, and you say to them, what are you doing? You're doing your homework. They've got the radio on full, they've got the video thing on, and they're doing their homework. I say, how can you do that? How can you do that? That would drive me crazy. They said, oh, that's odd. Well, there's something wrong with you. <laughs> okay. All right. They have been shaped by uncertainty about work, about family roles, about sexual roles, insecurity of who they are, and absence of collective success, as particularly in the US. And that's made them inwardly focused. Now, what's the price of this? 
Well, again, we've got some figures up there. The suicide rates, and we're aware of this in New Zealand, I think we're still the second worst in the OECD um, ratings. Higher rates of depression and malaise, sickness among young people. They've done surveys in university hostels, and they've found that young people from 75 onwards report headaches, indigestion, sleeplessness, and all those things, a rise of 31 to 45% in those 25 years. So, you know, I mean, young people say life is great, they're full of happiness and that, but you just look at the figures and some of these things tell you. All right, and a diagram I just want to look at, I'm not sure if we've got it, yeah, for suicide rates. And uh, it's, it's really a shocker because um, in the first half of the century, more elderly than young took their own life, but from about 1955, this is reversed. So now, for example, Americans who are born and raised in the 70s and 80s are three to four times more likely to commit suicide than the same people born in 1950. Now, that's horrendous. Now, that's three to four times. You know, you, you look at young people and you see what a free, wonderful, great life they have. But this is the other side of it. This is the dark side of young people's experience, and we must be aware of this. Okay. So we might just see if we can get a, a quick summary of this from Putnam's book. Now, what he shows is that time, money pressures, two career families, attribute to about 10% of the pressure on families and young people. Traveling, commuting, about 10%. Electronic media, 25%. But the greatest thing he says, it's generational change, is 50%. So what he's saying... You know that popular book about, you know, um, men are from Mars and women are from Venus? Okay. Well, it's a bit the same with young people. Young people often say, I wasn't born in the same world that you were. That's actually quite true. The generational gap has crept up on us, and there are huge, huge differences that have contributed to enormous differences. Now... What I want to move on to now to contrast with is this amazing experience I had when I went to John Paul II Catholic Bible College in Radway, Alberta. So if we could just have that slide and I'll tell you what I'm going to talk about with regard to the college. I want to talk very briefly about its history, about its mission statement and vision, about its organizational structure, how they form the young people, We've got a whole stack of testimonies at the back about them, what's happened there, why I think, in contrast to the young people and the world that they're living in, why it's been so successful. The history. When you go there to Radway, it's amazing. You drive across this plain and you arrive in this tiny little Canadian settlement that just looks like about 200 people there. And uh, all that there's there, the one structure which is bigger than any else is Radway the College, the Catholic John Paul II Bible College. It's about four stories whole, high. It's an old brick hospital, which the Grey Sisters abandoned in Canada because there was no longer enough demand for it. It began as the John Paul II Bible School in 1984. They had seven students and one director. In 2004, when I visited there at the beginning of last year, it had expanded to three campuses, one in Radway, one at Hinton, that's right on the border with British Columbia, and one down in St. Malo, which is quite a long way away, in Manitoba. Now, at each of those sites, at one site they had 45 students, another 25, another 20, and this year it's gone up, I believe, even larger. In other words, from seven students, they're now up to getting near 100 on three campuses. Now, this is their mission statement. Our mission is to offer Christian formation in an environment of Catholic spirituality, prayer, scripture study, and community life. We encourage all people to be fully alive in the spirit of Jesus and bring God our Father's healing love to our broken world. Now that is a beautiful statement. If you, if you had time to look at that, and I hope some of you will look at their stuff, um, in there there's such a profound statement of what young people are looking for. And they cut that down into their vision statement, which they can give in one little sentence. 
It says this, our vision is to see disciples fully alive in Christ Jesus, fully alive in every single way. How have they gone about that? Well, I want to have a look at the organizational structure now. They had to have an administrative team of director and two co-directors working collaboratively. And it's a wonderful model of how you work because they've got three very different people there and whenever they make a decision, it's by consensus. They'll keep on talking till they agree. And they're such different sorts. You have um, uh, John who came out here. Uh, some of you may hear, heard him speak. And he's a most charismatic, dynamic, extraordinary singer, performer, artist, a wonderful guy, John Connolly. You then have Ernie Chauvet, who's the tough French Canadian, you know, tough bargainer, right straight to you, and, and very practical and very, very um, a capable man. And then you have Loretta, who's a real hope good. What a lovely name, hope good, eh? And she's a real earth mother, you know. She's the one when the students are really down in the dump, they can go along and get a hug from Loretta. And uh, she's a grandmother, I think, but very youthful, and she runs the whole pastoral program. But like many women like that, very loving, but extremely <laughs> perceptive. Not a thing would get past Loretta. She would know exactly what's happening to every student. So she's amazing. So they have a wonderful group there. They have a board of directors to make sure that they're accomplishing their mission. And then they have layers of structure. A group of people looking after household matters. They have an office, very efficient. They have prayer ministry, people whose whole uh, task is to pray for the school and to help inform the students in how to pray. They have a formation team, an evangelization. They teach the students how to go out and present their faith to other Catholics. That's a very important part of it. And what they've done, every year at the end of the year, they've invited back for another year five or six of the most outstanding pupils they have. And they keep on building this up. And what they've done now is they have about 100 ex-students who now go out and do ministry, they organize, they fundraise, they are extraordinary young people. What's their formation program, our next thing? Well... It's a live-in program for nine months. The first eight months is personal formation, trying to help each person discover where is Jesus in my life? Where has he been through everything that's happened to me? How can I meet this Lord of my life, my lover, and respond to him? How can I get out under? And some of them have come, you know, with troubles. They've had family bust-ups. They've been involved with drugs. Some of them, some of the girls, you know, had abortions and are trying to get out of that lifestyle, all these sorts of things. Well, it works in one-week intensive inputs, things like theology, prayer, forms of prayer, scripture, Christian psychology, all those sorts of things. They have a practicum and evangelization, in other words, getting up there, showing them how to do it, taking them out into the streets, giving them examples. They do workshops, retreats, seminars on things like justice, the church is teaching about the family and all those sorts of things. Now, what has come out of that? Now, at the back, at the stand we've got there, I have eight pages of testimonies, which I downloaded from the internet, from these students. And each single one of them is an amazing story. And there's eight pages. They just go on and on and on. I've just chosen two, which I thought were typical. First one is from a young man called Blair Marshall. He's from New Brunswick. 23, and this is what he said. When you find Jesus working in a community like this, you really want to work hard to strip away all that you have so that you may have the pearl of great price. The great price, price is our current way of life, and the pearl is the new liberty to live as a child of God. Isn't that fantastic from a 23 year old? See the journey they've come, extraordinary. And just to show you that they're not all like that, every year they've had some older couples. And last year they had two couples from, New, from Christchurch in New Zealand, two married couples. And one of them, Celia Kennedy, this is what um, her witness, she said this. This year at Bible school has been a journey into the unknown with time to read, pray and listen. Several hidden areas of my life have now come to light. It's been a time of healing, of deep and prayer life and wonderful discoveries and friendships. God is so good. 
Africa. It's a 53-year-old New Zealander. So, you know, for all of us, it's never too late. I think they've actually had, um, they had one couple who'd been working on Indian reservations in the north of Canada, and they were in their 60s, and they came there and to Radway and did this thing together. Extraordinary. So you get from 18-year-old to 60-year-olds. Most of them are in their early 20s, but there's a good age range. What about these graduates? Well, just a list here of what they've come to. When I got this out of their magazine at the beginning of 2004, they had more than 700. Well, now it would be up to probably about 850. Of the 700 at that time, about half of them came from Alberta, the rest of Canada, 35%. They got 5% of students from the USA. I met some very impressive young Americans here, some South Americans, an African, and an Asian, uh, some coming from Europe. I heard a young lady speak there. I won't digress about this, um, uh, who came from uh, Brazil, and she had one of the most amazing conversion uh, stories I have ever, ever heard. I can't tell it now, except to tell you that she saw her mother, she was five-year-old, stabbed and killed and carved up by the father who put the pieces of body under her bed for a week before she buried it and then gave the young girl to his friends, and for six years she was sexually and physically and emotionally abused. Now that young girl, when she came to Canada, was so psychologically scarred that they told the, the um, adoptive parents that she would probably never be able to do more than live in a very simple basic state. Now she eventually ended up at, at the Bible school, and I heard her give her witness, <laughs> I have never heard something so moving, so extraordinary, so powerful, and so beautiful. And she was a radiant, beautiful, free, open young woman. That is a miracle. That is a miracle. <laughs> now, in 2000, uh, when they surveyed 500 ex-students, they discovered that that had 11 working as priests, deacons, and nuns who came in as students. As seminarians, they had seven current seminarians and religious. At least 40 had done one full year of evangelization. In other words, they'd gone out and worked as evangelists for a year. 48 had served on full-time parish ministry for a year or more. Some had served for two years on staff. Two, a number 74 had had more than two years in lay apostolate and ministry, and six had had a year in foreign mission work. Now, if you work that out in percentages, it's over 30%. Now, what school could we say in New Zealand 30% of its graduates end up giving work and commitment like that to the church? What's the reasons for their success? This is the next thing. I think the first thing is they restore community. Young people feel they live in a jungle that they're preyed upon, finding friends and who can you trust is one of their great problems. This community that I stayed in, it's like young people everywhere, sometimes they're irresponsible, they're a bit silly, but basically the love, the support, the affirmation, the sharing, the quality of love in that community touched me to the heart and they trusted each other, they'd overcome alienation. Many of them had restored their bonds with their families, they had been forgiven, and they have given forgiveness. There's a whole newness, a wholeness about them. The other wonderful thing is that many of them had been scarred sexually by relationships they shouldn't have been in. And because of the very careful structure of the school and the very strong rules they have, like no dating while you're in at school, they don't want any special friendships going on because it distracts, okay? But therefore, they were free. And the girls could trust the guys, and the guys could be warm to the girls without knowing they weren't going to get nailed to the wall, okay? And so there was a beautiful sense of camaraderie between the, the guys and the girls. And it's the most wholesome sort of thing, because they could trust each other, basically, and they could love without being exploited. And that's why it was such a wonderful place to be, okay? There was dynamic music and worship, and lots of personal prayer. If you added up all the prayer time in the whole day, it came to about three hours. About an hour at mass, an hour of personal prayer, and an hour of prayer or praise or prayer before classes. Three hours every day for nine months. You think what that does to people. There's solid Catholic teaching at an appropriate level and a chance to serve through ministry and service. 
Now, the crunch. <laughs> okay. Can you take an experience of Canada, which is strongly Catholic in parts, has got a big Catholic base, can you bring that to New Zealand? That's the question I want to pose to you and the great dream and vision that I have. So here we have it, ladies and gentlemen, a Catholic Discipleship College for New Zealand. Here is my dream. I stand, as it were, metaphorically naked before you because I'm putting up something which is a dream which to come about needs so much prayer and so much grace, and I can't do it. And uh, it's only a groundswell from ordinary Catholic folk like yourself that can do this. What's happened so far? Well, the idea began in 2000 when John Connolly first came to New Zealand, and a steering group was set up from the middle of 2002. We have been all the time in contact with Radway through correspondence, email, and telephone conferences. John Connolly has been here twice now. He's an amazing speaker. And we've had several graduates go there. And at this moment, there are two young people preparing, and there's a woman with two, with two young children on the North Shore who's preparing to go there uh, in about three months' time. Now, discerning our little group so far, we've looked at various locations. We are hoping that Not and Agree, which was mentioned the other night, could be there. The group, the board that runs that would love us to be there, but for that to be possible, they've got to get some more accommodation on site. So we're working at the moment of trying to get some rooms out there we could move on to site. We hope to start in March next year with about 15 students and five teams. Now, that's getting probably impossibly close. We'd still love to do that, but if we can't, we're saying to the Lord, Lord, we want to start in 2007. Do it. <laughs> okay. We've got an offer of help from Radway. They said they've got so many good graduates, and in Canada, so many people have heard of New Zealand and think it's a wonderful place. They said, if you ask for volunteers, young people to come out and serve for a year or two years in New Zealand, they'll fall over themselves to come. And we won't have any problem getting graduates. No problem at all. What's our vision so far? We want to conduct a nine-month residential course, very similar to Radway's, uh, from March to November. We would modify the teaching syllabus somewhat to fit in with the New Zealand church and our needs. What do we need? Well, what we really need is this. First thing is that lots of people have to pray and tell other people about it and say this is what we need in the church. If we can spread the vision with grace and love and commitment, it can happen. If it isn't caught by lots of people, it won't have enough base because we are a very small country and we've only got a small Catholic population. Therefore, it's got to be picked up by lots of people. We need a small group of full-time staff, not too many, like a principal director, which we've been looking and praying for for two years now. So hard to find somebody who isn't already connect, corrected to something already. We need probably perhaps a married woman or someone like that who work as a cook matron. Okay, we need a property manager, somebody who knows about that. We're looking for people who are good with music ministry, prayer leaders, a chaplain, spiritual director. I'm hoping that the Society of Mary will allow me to do that. Uh, but we also need lots and lots of part-time volunteers, people who will be accountants, financial advisors, publicists, come in on the weekend and cook to let the normal cook off. We need somebody to help with fundraising. We've had somebody come and speak to us. We've identified we need an endowment fund, which we'll have to get up and get people to leave bequests. But we also need seed capital. And for example, each student will probably have to pay about $5,000, about $4,500. Now, in any parish, if we got 30 people giving $10 a month for two years, we would be able to start instantly um, with half of those people paid for. We need spiritual support staff and prayer companions. Now really, um, it's got to come from ordinary people like you. And I'm going to go around in the next six months or a year, God willing, and my society allowing me to, and letting, them, letting me go from the theological college, which is a terrible sacrifice because there are very few moral theologians in New Zealand or Australia, um, I'm hoping to spread the word. Now, if you can help in any of these ways, even if it's a volunteer, um, please, I beg of you from the depth of my heart, 
At the back, we've got to stand there. You're just right there. At the moment, we've almost got approval as a, uh, a charitable trust. It's just being finalized now. Then we'll get an IRD number. And then if people want to contribute cash, they can. But the big thing is we want people's interest. We'll send you out a, a, um, a, a newspaper to let you know how things are going, to know that people are praying and supporting us. We want people to be promoters or go back to their communities, take the pamphlets they've got, tell other people about them and say, this is great, be on board. If you want to do something practical, support us today. What I've done is out of my 30-day retreat and out of my own experience, last year I wrote a book called Christ in a Grain of Sand. It was launched in America, and it's selling pretty well over there. It's selling in Rome and in Chicago and, and the U.S. Sold about 8,000 copies so far, I think. And I try to be modest, but it is actually, I think, a very significant step forward, trying to bring a very a picture of Christ at the center of creation into the deepest, oldest, one of the deepest, oldest spiritualities in the church, the Ignatian Exercises. And it has been praised as an extraordinary work of innovation. We're selling it for $30. If you try and get it from Pleroma, the only other place you can get it in New Zealand, costs $33.60. So you've got a bargain. <laughs> but if the Holy Spirit moves you to say, yes, I'll contribute, but instead of paying $30, I'll give $50 or $60 as a donation, well, God bless you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I must finish now. I'm up for my time. But thank you so much for your gift of listening to me. Thank you for, I know you will pray for this and keep it in your hearts. And I ask that you take this vision, you take it away with you, you grow with it, you let it out, and we begin a fire that will cover the whole of New Zealand and we begin to bring in young people to this immense, wonderful experience of faith. God bless you all.